Hi there, my name is Merit Ajo and I'm an optimization director at Search Discovery. And today I'm gonna to give you a tour of our sequential A-B test calculator, which is free for everyone to use on our website. So when you boot up the calculator, you're gonna notice, first of all, that there are some values that are already filled in for you. Now these are just placeholder values and you can change these to whatever you'd like. Um, the first panel here, has a series of inputs that should look very familiar to you if you've ever planned an A-B test before, right? For every test that you've planned, you probably need to decide what your alpha is going to be or your confidence level. Um, you need to decide what your beta is going to be or your power. Uh, you need to decide what, you need to input what the base conversion rate for the page or pages that you're testing on look like today. And you need to select a minimum detectable effect, or in this case, we're calling it a minimum effect of interest. And you also need to select how many tails you are going to have in the test, usually a one tail or a two tail. Now, currently with this calculator, we only support a one tail version. Um, and there are some caveats to that, which we'll get to in a minute. If you have questions about any of these, um, you can click on the little info icon and it will give you a little bit of a hint as to what we're looking for in that area. Now there is one optional input here, and that is to put in the average traffic that you get to your test page. Now, typically we're talking about unique visitors in terms of traffic. Now this will help you by immediately spitting out what a sample size would look like for a fixed horizon test. Now sequential test sample size is going to be a little bit different because the whole point of the sequential test is for you to be able to end a test early. And so what you get is a max potential sample size from a sequential test. Uh, which is uh, typically a little bit more than your fixed horizon. Um, so you get what it would normally be for a fixed horizon test, and then you get an expected duration based on the traffic figures that you put in. So again, these all come with defaults, but let's say you want to go with 90% confidence and 90% power. And let's say your base conversion is 5 and your random effect of interest is 5 as well. So you can see what this is telling us is uh, this test would take about 37 days for us to complete based on 10,000 unique visitors a day. Um, now this is a good candidate for a sequential test, right? Because we don't really want to run a test for 37 days. And so if we can make decisions early, we'd like to. Now if what spits out here is under 14 days, you may want to second guess your decision to run a sequential test in the first place because you really want to run a test for a couple business cycles, which is generally interpreted as one week. And more if you're if you're if you have holidays or under other unusual events that affect seasonality. OK, so now that we have like the basic inputs here for our test, we need to think about the sequential part of things. Right. And that the essence of that is selecting how many interim analyses we're going to perform on our test. So we're giving you a range of up to 10 interim analyses uh, and a minimum of two. Um, so you can select those here and you simply get a series of inputs here to decide not just how many analyses you want to do, but when you want to do those, when you're intending to do those. And the, the, the spacing of when you choose to do these analyses, it defaults to an even spacing uh, between all of your analyses. But the, the, the sequence of these actually does impact how you analyze your test. So let's say we want to make our first analysis at 5%, right? We're maybe gonna check to see that we're not doing any catastrophic harm right away. And then we're gonna hold off a little while. We're gonna do one at 30%. We're gonna do one at uh, 50%, then at 70%, and then at 85%. And I'm just making this up out of nowhere. So um, these are the basic inputs. And from there, you just click view test design. Now, at any point in time, you can change these and update the test design just by clicking on the CTA once again. So if we decide we want to, and the test design spits out below, we'll get to that in just a second. But let's say we decide we actually want to go to seven check-ins. Uh, it's going to revert you back to even spacing here. So we got to go back to 5%, 30%, 40%, 55%, uh, 70%, 85%. OK, and then we'll click view test design and that will reset everything below. So now what you get. Um, and this is iframed in, so you may get it may, you know, the scrolling may be a little funky, especially on um, Apple devices. But um, what it spits out is a plan for your sequential test. And the plan is over on the left. 
and then we'll get to where you can input data for an analysis of your test once it's running on the right. Um, what you see here, um, similar to above, we have the original fixed horizon test sample size, which in this case is 200,000. Um, then you have a maximum sample size under a sequential test. Now that's 233,000 or a 14% increase in potential max sample size. Now in all the simulations that we've done with sequential tests, you, you don't normally reach that far. And on average, you test significantly shorter than for a fixed horizon. So you're not, you're not particularly likely to hit this max increase in, in sample size, although it does depend. And you're most likely to hit that max if the observed increase or difference in the conversion rates is somewhere between zero and your minimum detectable effect, right? That's where, that's where um, you know, a fixed horizon test is really uh, pretty efficient. Okay, so the next section down, you get a table here with a bunch of numbers. I'm going to explain what these numbers are. So first of all, you have in the first column the percent of tests, and that corresponds with the numbers you input here on when you want to do the, the analyses, right? So because we don't have accounts that you can save this stuff to, you may want to take a screenshot of this, or you can come back to this and calculate your results at a later time. But this gives you the percent of the test, the sample size that represents that percentage, Right, and that's just um, that's just the total sequential test sample size, you know, times five percent, um, and that's total. That's conversion and test samples. Then you have the estimated number of days until you reach that sample size. It's helpful from a planning perspective. And then here is here's what you really want. These are called your decision boundaries: lower z-score and upper z-score. Um, now, z-score may not be something you're familiar with seeing in your test statistics, but it is the test statistic that you're calculating here. Um, and we offer it, you typically see it in place of a p-value here. And, and I think part of that is because p-values mean something specifically about, uh, about a probability of seeing a result at least as extreme as the one you're seeing, right? And you get your confidence level from one minus the p-value. That's where you get like 98% confidence, 99% confidence. That's, that's a 0.01. Uh, 0.02 p-value. Um, so the p-values are derived from the z-scores, but the z-score is less prone to misinterpretation in this context because the p-values cannot actually be taken at face level when you calculate them in a sequential test con context. So what these represent, though, are decision boundaries. Um, and the upper decision boundary is called the efficacy boundary. The lower decision boundary is called the futility boundary. Um, at least when you're running a one-tailed test, it's a futility boundary. Um, if you're running a two-tailed test, actually what you'll notice is that the upper and lower boundaries are the same, they're symmetrical, um, and you don't necessarily have to call one efficacy or, or futility, um, they just, they just uh, tell you what a difference is. Um, so in this instance, the upper boundary and lower boundary are quite different, and the reason for that is the lower boundary is trying to help you preserve your power or your chances of finding a difference, um, assuming that there is one. Um, and your upper boundary is help, trying to help you avoid a false positive, which is um, assuming there's a difference when there, there is, really isn't one. Okay, so what you do as you go through the test and you reach one of these checkpoints, what you should do is go is calculate the z-score for your test, and you can do that in the analysis over here, and then compare that z-score to the boundaries outlined here. And if your z-score falls above the efficacy boundary or below the futility boundary, then you can end the test. Now, there's a catch here. Uh, there's such thing as a binding boundary and a non-binding boundary. And a binding boundary means that you, th in order to maintain fidelity in the statistics, you have to end the test when you cross a boundary. A non-binding boundary means that you, it's interesting, but you don't have to end the test at that point if you don't want to. So in this setup, the futility boundary is a non-binding boundary, and the efficacy boundary is a binding boundary. I know that's a maybe a little deeper than we wanted to go here, but um, but it's important for you to know that. Okay, so that's that's the design of your sequential test. Now, a couple of things here, right? What happens if while you're running the test, your sample size doesn't match up, right? Like you end up you end up calculating your test statistic when total sample is ninety thousand instead of ninety three thousand. Well, let's let's go through that. Um, so you have a panel here where you can analyze your test results and you have inputs uh, for traffic in your control, traffic in your test and conversions in your control, conversions in your test. And you have a tab for each checkpoint in the test. 
right, up until the final one. So again, the checkpoints kind of correspond with that 5%, 30% for each row here. Um, so let's say the first check we actually do a little later, which would normally happen at 11,000. Um, let's say we ended up having like 10,000 in each recipe and you had a 10% conversion rate in control, 10,000 and uh, slightly higher conversion rate. What you get here is an immediate calculation on the test results. So you get the control uh, conversion rate, test conversion rate, the difference between the two, we're seeing a 5% increase, and the z-score, right? So that z-score, that's the test statistic that we need to compare uh, to our boundaries. And we see here that the percent sample is 9%. So you can cl click plot results and your z-score will show up on the boundary plot, but you can see it's a little out of line. Now, this isn't such a big deal since it's so far away from the decision boundary, but let's say your next check is, um, let's say it happens pretty close to the mark. Let's say you're at 32,000 and 3,200, 32,000 and 3,300. Let's see where that puts us. Uh, 1.3, we want to go a little higher. Let's go 3,400. 2.6, okay. So now you've got two points on here and both of them are a little off and it's kind of close to that close to that, but not exact. So it's actually pretty easy to change this. We would just go back and look at the percentages that we actually reached. So 9% here and 27%. We're gonna go back up to our design, click 9% and 27%. And we're gonna recalculate the design and it lined it up exactly with our analysis check-in points. And by the way, you may be accustomed in fixed horizon testing to know that you're not supposed to mess with the, the test design after you start the test. That's a big no-no. In, in the sequential models we're using here, you can actually, you can monkey with this a little bit. Now you don't want to change the number of analyses that you're doing, but it is common practice that you're gonna do these types of adjustments that you're seeing here with lining up your decision boundaries with the actual points of your analysis. So um, you can see that we've, uh, we haven't quite crossed a decision boundary. So let's say we continue the test a little further. You know, we're gonna to get to our third checkpoint and let's say we're at 43,000, 4,300, oops, 43,000 and 4,500. Uh, let's say 4,550, okay. So this time you can see our Z-score here is 2.81. And we're expecting to be at 2.54 at the decision boundary. So if we plot this, it popped us outside and we get some test results. We'll get to that in a second, but I really want to line this up with uh, the correct boundary. So 37%, I'm going to go up here and change this to 37%. Okay, I've got my boundaries lined up. You may get a little overlap, a little messiness in the graph if the numbers are too close together. But we've crossed a boundary. And whether you cross the upper or lower boundary, uh, the, the plot is going to tell you you've crossed a boundary and you can make a decision. Um, in this case, it's the efficacy boundary. So we have a non-binding test design here. So we need to end the test now. Um, what we also get here is a confidence level and a confidence interval. Now these have been adjusted from what you would normally get from a, from a confidence calculator. Like if you were to go out and find one on the internet, um, it would give you a higher confidence level and a narrower confidence interval. And those should be ignored. Um, these, these are adjusted confidence level or P values and confidence intervals um, based uh, or taking into consideration the test design that you have here and the previous checks that you've made. Um, so this is the confidence interval, by the way, matches your confidence level. So we had a 90% confidence level, so that's a 90% confidence interval. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, we can make it, make a decision. We can report back, um, you know, the results of the test and, you know, have fun playing around with this. There are a couple other hints in here. Um, there's some links to additional documentation if you'd like. Um, and you know, we always welcome your feedback. I uh, hope you enjoy using this calculator. Um, again, my name is Merritt Ajo. I'm an optimization uh, director at Search Discovery, and uh, feel free to reach out anytime.